I've spent over 100 hours testing the brand new MetaQuest 3 against every aspect of the Quest 2 and the Quest Pro. And here is everything you need to know about these devices as fast as possible so you can confidently make the right purchase decision or no purchase at all. Let's get started. The Quest 3 now has a pancake lenses just like the Quest Pro, which fixes the Quest 2's blurry image quality towards the edges of the screen, as well as the light ray issue when looking at bright colors on dark backgrounds. The Quest 3 also gets a notable improvement in field of view. For reference, here's the maximum width and height I can see in the home environment on the Quest 2. Here it is on the Quest Pro, and here's what I can see on the Quest 3. This wider field of view gives you a competitive advantage in multiplayer games because you can see enemy players in your peripheral that players on a Quest 2 can't see. And in case you're wondering, here are the official field of view numbers from Meta. The Quest 3 also gets a 30% increase in resolution, but since that resolution is spread over a wider field of view, you end up with a still incredible 25% perceived increase in resolution over the Quest 2 and nearly a 14% perceived increase in resolution over the Quest Pro. And while all three headsets use LCD screens, the Quest Pro has local dimming, which should allow you to see more details in the dark areas, but that was not the case in any of my testing. In reality, the high resolution of the Quest 3 made even the dark areas look more detailed compared to the Quest Pro. The only time I was able to see any benefit of the local dimming was when looking at completely black areas. The Quest Pro looked almost completely black, while the Quest 2 and 3 looked like a really dark gray. And since the Quest Pro is just using local dimming and not an OLED display, you'll still get blooming whenever something that's not super dark enters your field of view. In terms of aliasing, which are the jagged edges on outlines that you can see in this image from the Quest 2, the Quest 3 gets a significant improvement over both the Quest 2 and Quest Pro. Though it isn't completely gone, as can be seen along the edge of this round platform. Another big improvement to the Quest 3 is the addition of a depth sensor and two high resolution color cameras. This gives the pass through mode 10 times the pixels compared to the Quest 2 and two times the pixels compared to the Quest Pro and makes it possible to read a quick message on your phone or check your watch without having to take the headset off. Reading messages on your phone was tremendously difficult to do on the Quest Pro and near impossible on the Quest 2. That said, the Quest 3's pass-through still suffers from warping when you move anything close to your face, and it needs to significantly increase the resolution, improve color accuracy, and get a big increase to dynamic range before you start to forget you have a headset on. Another significant improvement that the depth sensor adds is the ability to create your guardian automatically just by looking around your room. And in case you're wondering, your guardian is just what keeps you from accidentally punching a wall when you're in virtual reality. This automatic room scanning also scans your furniture, which is tremendously important for the next big improvement on the Quest 3, and that's mixed reality. This is a feature that allows you to see both the real and virtual worlds at the same time. Once your room, or even an entire floor of your home is scanned, you can play mixed reality games in a massive area. And since my furniture was also scanned, the virtual characters can climb on and even hide behind my real furniture. However, if you move your furniture after the initial scan, it doesn't automatically update and it'll throw off the immersion. And while your furniture can obscure virtual objects, your hands can't. At least not for now, but that feature will likely come in a future firmware update. And to be clear, many mixed reality games are playable on the Quest 2 and the Quest Pro, but the experience will be dramatically better on the Quest 3. Now let's talk about performance. The Quest 3 gets a Snapdragon XR2 Gen 2 processor, which makes a dramatic difference in graphical capabilities compared to both the Quest 2 and the Quest Pro. This can easily be seen in games like Red Matter 2, where you now have real-time shadows and significantly higher texture resolutions, which are getting close to PC VR level detail. Even the home environments get a boost in quality with extra effects like water reflections and ripples and higher resolution textures. For reference, not even the Quest Pro has these enhancements, despite having foveated rendering, which is a feature that substantially increases the resolution only where your eyes are looking. Foveated rendering is not on the Quest 3, but clearly the XR2 Gen 2 processor more than makes up for that difference. Beyond the graphical improvements, there are also slight reductions to the headset's boot up time, as well as game loading times that are noticeable but not dramatic. If you want to take the visuals on your Quest 3 from stunning to mind blowing, and you have a powerful gaming PC, you can use Meta's official AirLink app to wirelessly stream high-end virtual reality games from your computer to your headset with unbelievable graphic detail. 
Meta's Airlink app currently allows for up to 90 hertz streaming with 120 hertz coming in a future update. That just means you'll get smooth motion now with super smooth motion in a future update. You also get up to 1.5 times render resolution and a maximum bit rate of 200 megabits per second if your computer and network can handle it. In simple terms, this just means you'll get the best possible graphics quality. Just remember that the streaming quality depends heavily on how powerful your computer and how fast your Wi-Fi network is. And you might need to connect your computer directly to your router with an ethernet cable to get the best performance. Speaking of Wi-Fi, the Quest 3 gets an upgrade from the Wi-Fi 6 that was on the Quest 2 to Wi-Fi 6E, just like the Quest Pro. This allows for even faster, more reliable streaming, but you also need a Wi-Fi 6E capable computer and router for that to work. And if you've tried AirLink on a Quest 3, let us know what your setup was and how it performed in the comments down below. Meta says the audio on the Quest 3 gets a 40% boost in volume and an improvement in bass and clarity compared to the Quest 2. So let's test that using high quality in-ear microphones, which come astoundingly close to capturing the actual sound quality from the headset, provided you're listening to this video with decent earbuds or headphones. You heard that right. While the Quest 3 sounds fuller and louder than the other two headsets at 73% volume, the bass and fullness falls off the closer you get to 100%, leading to a more tinny sound. So much so that the Quest 2 sounds better than the Quest 3 at max volume, even though the Quest 3 is technically a stitch louder at 100% volume. So bottom line, if you don't pass 73% volume, which is the fifth volume level from the max, the Quest 3 does sound notably more clear and louder. Now let's see how the built-in microphones compare. Here's a microphone test with a Quest 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's a microphone test with a Quest Pro. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here's a microphone test with a Quest 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. One problem with the Quest 3 is that the headphone jack has been moved to the right side of the headset, while most over-ear headphones on the market have the jack on the left side. So you'll need a longer cord if you want to use your headphones unless you get a USB-C to 3.5 millimeter headphone jack adapter, in which case you can plug your headphones directly into the USB-C port. And if you want to use the Elite Strap with battery pack at the same time, just get an adapter that supports power pass-through. I'll leave a link to both adapter styles in the description and pinned comment if you're interested. Unfortunately, you still can't use Bluetooth wireless earbuds or headphones with the Quest 3 because the sound delay is so bad that it's near impossible to play games like Beat Saber. That said, if you really want wireless earbuds, then Soundcore's VRP10 wireless earbuds have worked amazingly for me. That's not sponsored, I literally use these things all the time with my Quest headsets. These have the official Meta stamp of approval and have a USB-C power pass-through so you can use them with the Elite strap with battery pack. I'll have a link to these in the description and pinned comment if you want to check them out. The Quest 3 controllers now use IR tracking LEDs built into the body of the controller, as well as constant hand tracking instead of the rings from the Quest 2 controllers. This allows you to bring the controllers closer together, which makes manipulating VR objects easier. Not having the rings also makes them lighter than both the Quest Pro and Quest 2 controllers and make the controllers feel less top-heavy. This makes them more comfortable and easier to use for fast and precise motions. And fun fact, you can use your finger to navigate through menus even while holding the controllers, though this feature is already available on the Quest 2 and Quest Pro. In terms of tracking quality, the new controllers pass my Beat Saber Expert Plus test, and throwing things and using a bow and arrow both work well. And while the Quest 3 does support the Pro controllers, if you want to buy them separately, I personally don't see a need to upgrade, especially not at the cost of a brand new Quest 2. The haptic feedback, which is the vibration you feel in the controllers, feels identical to the Quest Pro's super crisp vibrations since it uses the same True Touch haptics. But the haptics are slightly less intense than the Quest Pro's controllers. The Quest 2 controller haptics feel a bit loose by comparison to the Quest 3 controllers. Every vibration seems to rattle a little longer instead of stopping immediately like on the Quest 3 and Quest Pro controllers. My one complaint with the Quest 3 controller haptics is that I wish they were a bit stronger. Sometimes they feel just a little bit too weak for me. 
To test battery life, I ran two different tests. The first was a worst case test of streaming a high-end VR game from my computer set at the maxed quality settings on both the game and the Quest 3. After just one hour, I was down to 42% and the headset died after an hour and 40 minutes. For the second test, I played a handful of games locally on the Quest 3 with the display set to its max refresh rate of 120Hz. After an hour of playing, I still had 61% left and the headset completely died after about 2 hours and 15 minutes. But keep in mind, your battery life is going to be less if you play mixed reality games or you only play games that have been updated to take full advantage of the Quest 3's increased processing power. Regardless, my testing lines up pretty well with Meta's official battery life estimates. And if you need more battery, you can get Meta's Elite Head Strap with a battery pack, which is both comfortable and can nearly double your battery life. Or if you want to save some money, there's some great third-party options as well that I'll link in the description and pinned comment if you're interested. As for the controllers, there's no specific battery life listed on Meta's website, but a single AA battery will last you many hours before needing to be replaced. I still have about 80% left on my controllers with the original batteries. And when it does come time to replace the batteries, the new controllers have an easy to push button to release the battery cover. This is a whole lot easier than trying to remove the battery cover on the Quest 2's controllers, and a whole lot faster than having to charge the Quest Pro controllers if you accidentally ran them dead, since those don't have replaceable batteries. If you prefer rechargeable batteries for your Quest 3 controllers, and you want wireless charging, you can get Meta's official wireless charging dock. This comes with rechargeable battery replacements, and lets you charge everything wirelessly just by placing it on the dock. I'll leave a link to this in the description and pinned comment as well if you're interested. For my charge speed test using the official 18 watt power adapter and keeping the headset turned off, the Quest 3 charged at about 1% per minute all the way up until about 90%, then slowed down a bit, finishing up its charge at 107 minutes, which is significantly faster than Meta's official 2.3 hour estimate. In terms of comfort, the facial interface on the Quest 3 is a bit more abrasive compared to the Quest 2's tremendously soft interface, but both are very comfortable. Compared to the Quest Pro, the comfort is a bit of a toss-up. The Quest 3 puts more pressure on your cheekbones, but the Quest Pro puts more pressure on your forehead. However, I do like how the optional full light blockers on the Quest Pro feel on my cheeks compared to the facial interface on the Quest 3. But regardless, the facial interfaces on all three headsets are plenty comfortable for extended use. One advantage of the Quest Pro is that it has three levels of immersion. The first is no facial interface with completely open sides so you can still see your environment. The second is partial light blockers made out of a soft silicone which actually isn't very comfortable. And the third is an optional full light blocker that's also made out of silicone and is much more comfortable. In terms of light leak around the facial interfaces, every Meta headset has at least some light leak around the nose. The Quest 3 lets in a bit more light than the Quest 2, but a bit less light than the Quest Pro. However, as soon as the display turns on, I stop noticing any light leak regardless of which headset I'm using. Looking at the bottom of the Quest 3, you'll see a wheel that adjusts the spacing of the lenses to match the spacing between your eyes for a clearer image. This is called interpupillary distance, or IPD for short. The lenses can move from 58 to 70 millimeters apart, but thanks to a wider eye box, the Quest 3 accommodates eye spacing from 53 to 75 millimeters. My recommendation is to refer to this chart from Meta and set the IPD on the Quest 3 to the widest setting that fits your eye spacing. This will give you the widest field of view in the headset. The Quest 2 and Quest Pro also have IPD adjustments, but require you to physically move the lenses, which is notably harder to do with the headset on. Looking closer at the inside of the Quest 3's facial interface, you'll see two buttons that allow you to adjust the position so you can comfortably wear glasses with the headset on. And while there's four positions to choose from, I recommend only extending it as far as you need to because the further you extend the facial interface, the lower your field of view will be when you put the headset on. Unfortunately, this adjustment method isn't without its flaws. In fact, after just a few weeks, mine has already stopped working and can freely slide in and out. Perhaps that's just a manufacturing defect on my headset, or maybe it's a result of me constantly taking the facial interface on and off to film this video, but I figured it was worth mentioning. The Quest 2 can also be adjusted for glasses, but requires you to remove the entire facial interface to install a spacer. The Quest Pro has the easiest adjustment thanks to a wheel at the top of the headset. In terms of comfort when wearing glasses, the Quest Pro is the most comfortable thanks to the flexible silicone interface followed by the Quest 3, mainly because it doesn't steal my glasses like the Quest 2 does when I take the headset off. But at the end of the day, all three headsets are plenty comfortable to use with glasses on. 
If you prefer not to wear glasses with your headset on, you can get prescription lens inserts for all three headsets, but I recommend trying the headset on with your glasses first before spending the extra money on the lenses. Looking at the head straps, the Quest 3 now has a split style head strap that accommodates a ponytail. And it's mostly comfortable for short term use, but I found that after about an hour of having the headset on, these tensioners on the back start to hurt my head. The Quest 2 strap isn't any better, but the Quest Pro has the most comfortable head strap by a large margin, thanks to a much more even weight distribution from front to back. That said, the optional Elite strap with battery pack for either the Quest 2 or Quest 3 is tremendously comfortable and takes a lot of the weight off your face thanks to the rear mounted battery pack evening out the weight distribution. Both battery packs can be charged with a rear mounted charge port and you can plug an external battery pack to that port for even longer play sessions. The Quest 3's Elite strap has the added benefit of a button that you can press to see the estimated battery life. Flashing orange is low battery, solid orange is partially charged, and green is fully charged. If you plan to use VR for productivity, you can connect your Quest 3 to your laptop or desktop computer and create massive virtual screens that make working easier. And thanks to the resolution, clarity, and pass-through improvements, the virtual text is tremendously clear and you can easily see all the characters on your real keyboard. On the Quest Pro, virtual text looks good, and seeing your keyboard text is okay, but you can't take off the facial interface so you can see your real keyboard just by looking down with your eyes. Virtual text on the Quest 2 was easy enough to read, but would strain my eyes after an extended period of time. And seeing the characters on your real keyboard is near impossible on the Quest 2. For optional accessories that you could purchase separately, you get a carrying case, the wireless charging dock, the Elite strap with or without the battery, two optional colored facial interfaces, active straps for the controllers, a silicone facial interface, and Zenni optical prescription lens inserts if you don't want to wear your glasses with the headset. The Quest 3 comes with either 128 or 512 gigabytes of storage depending on how much cash you want to spend. And I have affiliate links in the description and pinned comment to the best deals I can find if you're interested. If you're a casual VR player, 128 gigabytes will be more than enough. But if you're a hardcore VR gamer, you'll want to spring for the 512 gigabytes so you can keep all your games installed. I consider myself a moderate VR gamer and I ordered the 128 gigabyte version. Right now, for a limited time, you can get Asgard's Wrath 2 for free when you order the 128 gigabyte version. And if you order the 512 gigabyte version, you'll also get six free months of MetaQuest Plus where you can get two free games per month handpicked by Meta. However, once you end your subscription, you'll lose access to all the free games you received. Think of it like Xbox Game Pass, but for VR. Speaking of which, Xbox Game Pass is coming to the Quest soon, so you'll be able to play a bunch of Xbox games on a huge 2D screen inside the headset of your Quest 2, Quest Pro, or Quest 3. I'll be keeping an eye out for more deals on the Quest 3, and we'll be updating those affiliate links with new deals as they come up, so be sure to check back, especially around Black Friday. So, is the Quest 3 worth the upgrade? Well, if you have a Quest 2, and you play VR games at least once a week, or you play competitive VR games, then I'd say the Quest 3 is worth the upgrade. The field of view, clarity, resolution, and higher quality graphics make the Quest 3 a significant upgrade over the Quest 2, provided you're playing games that take advantage of that processing power, like Red Matter 2, Guardians, Golf Plus, and many more. However, there currently aren't any Quest 3 exclusive games, so if you're content with your Quest 2's performance, maybe just wait a bit before switching to the Quest 3. If you currently own a Quest Pro, the decision's a bit more difficult. The resolution and clarity will be very similar between these two headsets, but as more and more games get updated to take advantage of the Quest 3's enhanced processing power, most games will objectively look better on the Quest 3. So how about this? If you primarily play PC VR games on your Quest Pro, then don't get the Quest 3 because the enhanced processing power won't make a difference. But if you primarily play standalone games on your Quest Pro, then the Quest 3 will feel like an upgrade if you play games that have been updated for the Quest 3. And if you currently don't own any VR headsets, maybe just start with the Quest 2 since it's currently at a significantly lower price, so you can test the waters before going all in on a new platform. If you want to see a deep dive just on the Quest Pro, check out this video here. And if you enjoy deep dive reviews like this, consider subscribing and turning on notifications so you don't miss future uploads. That's it for this tech episode. God bless guys, and I'll catch you in the next one.